All right, so welcome, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to our training. And my name is Brenda Rogers, and I'm the training manager here at Young Living and the corporate trainer. So I practice as a naturopath part time. I do uh, a lot of hormonal work, menopause, PCOS, fertility work. I love it. I also teach yoga and love the mind body connection there with yoga and we just did a yoga class yeah. didn't we we used yeah. the essential oils in the yoga class and that is amazing whole different experience and i also do some raindrop i teach the raindrop training and i use raindrop in my clinic as well or i don't use it i do it and um just love that whole aspect of training people in health and wellness it's really rewarding so let's talk about our topic tonight, essential oil basics. And um, there's more to it than this, but I wanted to give you a good start on some of the basic concepts around essential oil. Some of you, it will be a repetition. For some of you, it'll be completely fresh. But these are the types of things that as somebody new to oils or new to the Young Living community or new to the business, you really want to know this stuff and you know it well so that you can explain to people why essential oils. Just being exuberant and enthusiastic is not enough, especially if you're talking to different personality types to you. So some personality types are convinced by your excitement and buzz, but other, others, they want, they want facts. They want details, they want scientific reports, they want whatever. And so we need to accommodate those with, um, with different types of information. But today, so today I'm giving you a little bit of science, a little bit of safety and whatever else we can. And we're going to answer your questions too if you'd like to type them in onto the text box. So let's start with an explanation of what an essential oil is. So it's a highly concentrated aromatic liquid and it comes from either shrubs or flowers, trees, roots, bushes, herbs and seeds. So where does lime oil come from, for example? You can type that in if you like. Where does lime oil come from? Where do the citrus oils come from mainly? Where, do, where are they from? Anyone know? Do you know? The skin. They come from the peel. Oh, sorry, there was a bit of a delay there. I, 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 you are awake. I do know you are awake. <laughs> the rind, the skin from the fruit, right? Mm. So others like the, the woody ones might come from the, 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 the um, bark or the uh, cinnamon bark we have comes from the bark. It might come from the whole tree. It might come from the seeds and so on. So... Uh, lots of different variations and that's important to remember because if the oil comes from the flower and the oil that you have maybe it's the flower maybe it's something else then you might have an oil that says chamomile but it's the bits of the chamomile plant that don't have the oil in it so that can be a way of sometimes doing dodgy things so these liquids defend plants from insects harsh environmental conditions and disease. So these oils have a purpose in the plant. And often the more harsh the conditions, the more the higher level of either the oil itself or some of these gorgeous constituents in it because the plant's trying to protect itself. These natural defensive mechanisms have been used since ancient times for their preventive and health-giving properties. So that means that we as human beings have recognised these qualities in the oils and we've been using them in various forms in a more primitive form thousands of years ago um, but now we have our wonderful extraction steam distillation and so on processes where we can really extract the maximum oil out and look um, and really take care of the plant at the same time in terms of using the, the minimum amount possible so that's what an oil is. So how is an essential oil different to a vegetable oil? Well, vegetable oils such as corn oil, peanut oil, olive, macadamia, avocado, any kind of oil are fatty acids. They contain fatty acids. That's the basic structure, the spine of the oil. 
and they have this greasy texture, as we know. Vegetable oils particularly oxidize very quickly and become rancid, which is why we want to avoid margarines and processed oils that have been, uh, you know, you really, they do have a very short shelf life, vegetable oils. Uh, and yet they're used widely in the food and takeaway industries. Uh, not a very healthy option, actually. Fresh out of the plant or in the whole plant is much better. So avocado is much better than avocado oil. But anyway, they have no antibacterial properties, vegetable oils, whereas the essential oils can have. So let's talk about the things that affect an oil's action. So here's some of your fundamentals about what produces a therapeutic quality oil. So in a sense, what we're talking about here is what you are paying for and what you're not getting when you get the $5 oil from the street market. So let's, this is scientific, this is data heavy, so bear with me, but this is important stuff for your belief and for the people that you're sharing with, and also for your confidence that what you're doing is having a beneficial action. So first of all, let's have a look a little bit about basic chemistry. So essential oils are not simple substances. So simple substances might be um, calcium citrate, very simple, or it might be XYZ drug. They're kind of single components, single compounds, whereas the essential oils are complex, containing up from 80 up to 500, sometimes up to 1,000 different chemical constituents that are working in, working in, in this harmonious, synergistic way. Let's use an example of lavender, which contains approximately 200 constituents in tiny, tiny amounts. And all of these constituents contribute to the oil's benefits to us to some degree. Some of them enhance, some of them balance. That's really important to remember, the balancing effect of this synergy that occurs with essential oils. You start to extract individual constituents out of something, like we do with, uh, with medications, you start to extract this single thing and all of the balancing components are taken away and then they start to become toxic. So we have extracted the essential oils from the plant, which may have some balancing action. So we still need to be mindful that what we're using is potent and that we need to um, be responsible in our use. So let's just have a look here, this beautiful image of basil, an innocuous herb that we eat with our pesto and our, um, I don't know, what else do you like to eat your, pesto, your basil with? Thai food. Thai food. Yeah, oh, yes, beautiful. Medicine. And in Indian, the Indians love basil. Mm. So this has some fantastic benefits. And... Uh, sorry, I've just thought I'll just have a quick look at my questions to see what you're asking me. Uh, question, can oils vaporise? Uh, so oils, essential oils are also known as volatile oils. And yes, they definitely can. You leave the lid off the bottle and it starts to evaporate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a light oil. And that makes it also different to vegetable oils. So thank you for that. And I'm not quite sure what your name is because your code here says A-L-E dash something or other. So, <laughs> um, so on. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Mark. Um, fresh tomato and basil makes a beautiful um, bruschetta, for example. Yeah, beautiful herb. But we use it as an oil. We use it in raindrop mm -hmm. and we use it in culinary. And it depends which type of oil. So various oils can have different constituents. So Basil high in linalool or fencol can be used for one purpose and that might have certain benefits. And then you have basil high in methyl shavacol and that can be used for another purpose, depending on sometimes which country it was grown in. And then you have eugenol like our oil 
And that contains constituents that have maybe that first benefit and the second benefit. So you can see this is good for us but it can also be an area where you can buy, be buying lesser quality, not the therapeutic quality, even though you're buying 100% pure. So you could have 100% pure basil over here that's not having the action that you want it to have. So this is where trusting your company is, is important. Maureen, thank you. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Yes, we did meet. Wonderful. All right, so let's have a look at extraction. We, the, the kind of healthy ways to extract the oils from the plants are these, steam, steam distillation, hydro distillation, and cold pressed extraction. And a couple of points about extraction. So oils derived from a second or third distillation of the same plant material is usually or are usually not as potent as oils extracted from the first distillation. So, but is the third distillation still 100% pure? Yes. But is it therapeutic grade? Not necessarily. However, sometimes you don't get those key chemical constituents until the third, the second or the third distillation. You've got to know what you're doing and you've got to measure. You've got to be able to measure those key constituents so that you know that you're getting the, the, uh, the, the grade of the oil that you're after. It's a, bit like, it's a bit like maple syrup. You can buy maple syrup that's A grade, B grade and whatever other grade. But if you want and what you need it for is the A grade maple syrup on your pancakes or whatever, then and you know, you know that you pay less um, less a lower price if you get the third or the, the the B or C version. So the part used can also change the composition of the oil. I've already mentioned this. If the oil is in the root, but the part used for some unknown reason is the aerial parts, then you're not going to get the oil or the oil with the the constituents that you require to the same extent. Now here's a big one. This is just a little couple of lines, but this is this is a, this is where a lot of room for uh, cheap oils can come in. So good quality oils. Uh, these are the things that we need to pay attention to. So oil constituents vary according to growing conditions. So the soil condition is important. The use of fertilizers. If the use of pesticides, pesticides kill the bacteria in the soil and the, and the bacteria are what help us get those nutrients out of the soil. Fertilizers change the whole thing. The geographical reason. So an oil from Oman might be different to an oil from Hawaii, which is going to have a different climate. Method of cultivation, whether something's farmed or wildcrafted, the climate, the altitude, and even which side of the mountain, because of course different sides of the mountain get different levels of sun. So all of these things can lead to higher or lower quality oils. Very important. Here we go, this is heat or pressure. So heat or pressure is a factor important in the quality of an oil. So oils that are subjected to heat or high pressure, and when does that happen? That happens when you want to rush the process of extracting. So that would happen if you are more interested in profit than in quality. So oils subjected to heat or high pressure may be noticeably lower or simpler or inferior in its chemical profile. So nature can't be rushed. And exposing the oil to heat and to pressure, which can also eat equal friction or heat can destroy the chemical profile and you're getting an inferior product. Another way of quickly getting oils out of plants might be with the use of sol solvents and this can alter the chemical profile as well. Adulterating, engineering and extending, another thing that happens extremely prevalently in the essential oil industry. Some oils can be extended with the use of synthetic-made compounds. So, for example, 
rosemary. You might have the profile, you know, on the G, the GC, the gas chromatograph, the pro profile for rosemary might like look like that. And all of the rosemaries we use are supposed to be like that. But the grower might grow one that looks like like that. It's not the same. It's not the it's not it's not the high quality that we want. So they can take a constituent that looks like that particular ingredient and they add that in and then the co the chemical profile looks the same and if you're not wary of that then those oils can be sold as perfectly pure and natural and they're not the same they've got synthetics in them so they change the energetic at the very least they change the energetics the, the, the frequency of the oil changes because man-made is completely different to nature-made when it comes to frequency. So very, uh, another important consideration. Frankincense is a, is a prized oil and it can be extended with diethylate or dipropylene glycol. And that is because some of the lower quality constituents don't smell the same and so, that, you know, they might add something in to help it, um, help it smell, the, smell better. And I, I like the example of um, crab sticks. You know, crab sticks or fish sticks? They're kind of like all the offcuts of the fish. And they, um, they put them all together and they bleach them and they, they um, clean, you know, they kind of mulch, mulch them up. And then they deodorize them so that it's not fishy. And then they add all these things that <laughs> they add all these things, not just tripe, there are other things as well. Uh, they add some wheat and some egg, they, they add all these things to make it flavorful. And then you've got seafood extender, which you know is probably not too bad, but certainly it's not perch, is it? It's not snapper. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in this similar. This is what similarly is what's happening in, in the oils industry. It's very common. So we know, for example, and I think this is on the next slide, much of the lavender on the market is the hybrid lavender. And lavender is fine. We have lavender in some of our products because it has a particular use, but it's not lavender. And if you're wanting lavender for some of its beneficial healing properties, then will lavender do, especially if it's got synthetics in, it certainly won't. You do not want to use lavender oil that's synthetic for the same benefits that pure lavender gives because you might actually get the opposite effect. And so quality here is, I mean, if you're just wanting to, you know, Put it in the toilet or something and it doesn't really matter if it's natural or synthetic you can do that but if you want a quality product for a quality purpose then you have to get the good stuff so let me just see my question see if you yes it's basically two different products um, and so, Tiani, this is recorded. Uh, all the webinars are recorded, so it'll be available on the virtual office within the next day or so. I'm coming, going to New Zealand tomorrow, so I might not get to it, but eventually it will get there. Um, Low-grade oils. Here we go. This is what qualifies as low-grade oils. So take note of this. They can be 100% synthetic. No frequency effect whatsoever. No, no energetic benefits whatsoever and probably no physical benefits either. Low potency oils can be cut with synthetic chemicals. So this is another way that, that uh, it can be done. Or they can use second, third or fourth, I still haven't fixed the spelling of that word, my apologies, fourth grade oils which are still considered pure. They're still 100% lavender or 100% whatever but they're the, the, the B grade or the C grade versions. However, an, an expert can smell the difference. Isn't that amazing? So you know those, even those oils sometimes where they've just added in that constituent, like the rosemary example that I gave you, an expert can smell it. 
you know, a bit like those wine tasters that can taste all that, you know, they're experts in tasting wine and all the flavours and everything in it. Same with, with the oils. Although at a commercial level, we use the, we use the gas chromatograph because that gives us the, the breakdown or mass spectrometry, spectrometry or optical refractometer. <laughs> Sorry. They should be easy to say, but it's the end of a long day. <laughs> Um, now, essential oils are unique because they have some of these qualities about them. They can penetrate the cell membranes. They have a lipid soluble structure. Lipid meaning fat, so they have a fat. They they are fat soluble, even though they're not fats. They're so, they're fat soluble, and it's very similar to the makeup of our cell membranes. And they're tiny, so these are the reasons why they can penetrate cell membranes. And if they're applied to the skin, they're in our body pretty quickly. So it can be uh, seconds or minutes or, you know, on average we say 20 minutes. So these are fairly unique properties. So on the scale of things, this is quite a useful little guide to explain to people about Young Living Oils. So down the bottom of the pyramid and the majority of oils that are out there, you've got synthetic or nature identical oils. Cheapest chips. Mass produced, always in season, of course, always available, never out of stock. Then we have our extended or altered oils. And there's many of those on the market. And then, you know, in the higher quality bracket, of course, we've got natural oils and organic uh, or certified organic oils. And there's, that's amazing too. They are amazing products. But you could have an organic B grade oil or third distillation oil. And so at a whole other level, we have therapeutic grade. Now, therapeutic grade, it's, it's not a body out there grading, independently grading our oils. Let's, admittedly, that's not the case. There isn't an organisation that does that. Maybe somebody could set that up and that might be great might be a great thing but in the meantime we have labeled we have self labeled our oils therapeutic grade it's a bit like Dettol calling themselves hospital grade or maple syrup being a grade or b grade although that's probably actually rated um, this is one of our terms that we use to explain the quality of our oils and i think now that we've discussed all the elements to that you can really understand it don't you think Give me, a, give me a thumbs up or a yes or a comment or, a, you know, now I get it or, or whatever. Yeah, because when we talk about seed to seal, this is what we're talking about. It takes a while to explain it. And honestly, it's not, it's not like sexy marketing or, you know, it, 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 it's harder to explain. But if you understand it and you get it and you know it, then at least you have that solid foundation in this uh, information. It takes a while. Yeah, it takes a while to get to it, Maureen. Thank you. All right. What have we got next? Okay. Let's talk about safety. How are we going for time? Fantastic. So I put the common sense oil there because... You need common sense when it comes to safety. There are really very few hard and fast rules, which can be frustrating for some people. People ask, can I use it for, uh, uh, uh. can I use it in this situation? And the, uh, the answer often is maybe, but maybe not. And so common sense is required. And I'll say in Raindrop all the time, if if in doubt, don't do it. Whether that's your intuition speaking or you just don't know or you don't have the knowledge, if in doubt, don't do it. Because if something happens, even if it's not related to the oil, it's on your head. And I believe that the more we can speak about oils and use oils responsibly and, with, and intelligently, the better off the whole industry will be and the better protected we'll be in the long term. Because if we start saying things and getting into trouble and doing stupid things, then the authorities and the regulatory bodies are going to come down on us hard. And we don't want that. We don't want to take away this gift. However, saying that, there are some general recommendations. Now, in my research, I've found 
that there can be variations on some of these recommendations. They are still not hard and fast. And just noting your comment, Natalie, thank you. I will take note of that. So menthol, so there are several oils that contain menthol and peppermint is probably the most well known. Not recommended around the throat or neck area of children under 18 months of age. And that, that is probably a good advice for most oils, many of the oils, unless they're super safe like lavender. You're best to work on the feet rather than around the throat and neck area um, for, for the little ones. At the very least, you don't want them touching it and then rubbing it into their eyes or something like that. But particularly with the menthol oils, you don't want to upset that respiratory function. Photosensitivity. You may have heard of photosensitivity. Now, when the press is talking about photosensitivity and they're exaggerating, they might use the word phototoxicity, which is very dramatic. But simply what it means is that when you expose your skin to sun, after you've put the oil on it, it's more sensitive. And that can be to, uh, to sunburn or even to, you know, to the point where it can be a bit of a rash. So let's have a look at that. The photosensitive oils are largely the citrus oils to varying degrees. Now, we have grapefruit, for example, in lip balm but it's such a small amount that, and it's sort of diluted with all the other ingredients that it's not uh, a terrible issue. And honestly, if your lips are a little bit browner, then that's not such a terrible thing, right? It looks a bit like lipstick. Um, however, the other oils, if you're using them as, um, you know, like I often do, I dab them on my neck or you dab them here and, you know, you, you know, and then you go out and sunbake for the day, which I don't recommend anyway, then just be wary that that can cause this dark pigmentation or sometimes a rash. And it can last a day or two. So know your oils, particularly know your blends. And if there is a citrus oil in there, then you need to be careful with direct application. So photosensitivity is only for topically. My understanding, I don't believe if you sprinkle a little bit of lemon oil in your, um, in your, your water, for example, that you're going to um, produce photosensitivity. So I believe it's just topical application, direct application. So here's another warning. It's a common sense warning. Keep oils away from the eyes. Now, I haven't done that in the past. Have you not done that sometimes? If you're using, for example, um, deep relief on the temples. <laughs> peppermint. <laughs> With peppermint, sometimes it gets a little close. And, you know, with, when you're new, you, you do things. Maybe you don't know that you're not supposed to or you put a little bit too much on. And then, you're, and then you know, it's in the eyes and suddenly your eyes are watering. Um, the worst thing you can do is put water on it because that just drives it in. And this is where we need our V6 or some coconut oil or olive oil or something like that to wipe it away, um, you know, or just wipe it on the temple where, where you've placed it just to dilute it. Also with the ears, you never put oils directly in the ears. They are, um, it's just not a good idea. Um, and in fact, you know, some herbalists and aromatherapists might recommend putting something in a base oil, but I would, I would say speak to a proper trained aromatherapist if you're considering doing things like that and get the okay from them. Obviously, if you handle contact lenses or rub your eyes, then you have the potential of getting the oil into your eyes as well and causing some irritation. And with the kids, you know, having them play around with the oils and then they rub their eyes, they can also be affected by that. Yep, any oil, vegetable oil, olive oil. I like the V6 because it doesn't stain and it's got all those beautiful, six beautiful vegetable oils in it. So let's talk about essential oils in pregnancy. I know, I know in our culture um, there's a lot of ignorance around pregnancy and there's a lot of fear as a consequence. If we were well educated around what's okay and normal in pregnancy, it would be a very different story. So the cautions that we have with essential oils around pregnancy are to 
kind of take that into account. So we don't recommend that a person starts with the oils after they've fallen pregnant because there's no precedent, there's no testing to see whether that has been fine for them in the past. However, saying that, it's completely up to the individual. There are some oils that are not recommended in pregnancy, so you do need to do some research. And some that are well researched and well um, thought of, uh, you know, there's, there's information out on the internet about what is suitable or how to use them suitably in pregnancy. Obviously, diffusing is a lot different to putting oils directly on the skin or putting them into your water or flavouring, for example. So generally, oils are common. Um, oils are safe, beg your pardon, but common sense is still needed. Avoid typically the first trimester unless somebody is very familiar and used to the oils and then they might want to use some of the oils for some of their discomfort you know, early on. But otherwise, uh, stick to later on in the pregnancy. Now, I did have a quote um, or I, I read this beautiful thing um, about oils in pregnancy that um, it's actually in my notes in the slides and I can't access that because otherwise you won't be able to see the slide. But it was basically about the, the, the number of women have spoken about the beautiful experience they've had from the baby when they are um, exposed to the oil. So uh, by exposed, I mean maybe there's lavender diffusing in the, um, in the room or something, or they've diluted and put a blend somewhere, maybe uh, a safe blend on their tummy, Massage. especially later in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then there's this beautiful, um, the, the quote was about this beautiful experience that the women have, have had with the oils. And I'm sure there's a lot of stories out there that you, you guys could tell as well about that so so that you know that my point in saying that is it's not to be like no you can't have it in pregnancy because some people use it and and and, and love the experience but it's an individual thing and um and so now we have some more cautions so some of these oils are to be avoided with uh some medical conditions and that would be particularly epilepsy and high blood pressure and once again, the recommendation is to consult a health, a health professional. And obviously, that health professional needs to know oils. So has some aromatherapy training. Because if you ask your doctor, they aren't going to know. You don't ask your doctor for financial advice. And you don't ask your investment plan, planner for medical advice. So you, you need to find in your community somebody who is familiar with essential oils. And having said that, some... Australian trained aromatherapists have different perspectives on oils than us in Young Living. They, they may not be aware of some of the uses that are common now and their training says something different. So if you're not finding out the information that you need, then you need to do more research. There are tremendous books on the market. Um, there is research, actual research online, not just not just Pinterest graphics, but actual research uh, on websites like PubMed, for example, where you can find information. So extra caution is required with basil, rosemary, sage and tansy, for example. Let's have a look at dilution. We've already talked about this and the V6 oil or as mentioned, coconut oil, olive oil, almond oil and so on. Or in some cases, for example, in raindrop, we might use orthoese or you might use orthosport and this can dilute uh, uh, the neat oils as well. Just a quick word about wastage and, as, and particularly as the market expands and it's not, remember, it's not just Young Living, that the worldwide demand for essential oils is increasing. And so just be mindful that you are part of a demand and demand creates industries it creates businesses and then in some cases it creates dodgy stuff so in order to meet meet the demand lands can be cleared and 
it, species can be close to ex extinction, all in this pursuit of money and profit and meeting demand. So be mindful that you are a part of this. And so, first of all, treat every drop with the preciousness that it is. Don't waste oils. If you have an oil, don't leave the drop off. I mean, the, the lid off. Don't leave the lid off. Uh, don't shove them in the cupboard and never use them. Uh, don't, I don't know, if one drop can do it, don't use 10. And yes, that might be good for business, but it's not good for our world. It's not good for our planet. So be mindful and treat things with the respect that they absolutely deserve. We know how many tons of, oil, of raw material are required to make these oils. And so it's just a reminder not to forget that they come from nature and nature is to be respected. So my little little soapbox over. I'm going to step down now and talk about. That's my little theme for tonight. Um, reactions. Let's have a look at reactions. And I, I think I, I put sort of reactions in inverted commas because what sometimes looks like a reaction isn't always a reaction. Let's have a look at allergies. So allerg reactions can look like an allergy. So the first thing to do is to test. If you have somebody who's allergic to everything, you're not going to go 10 drops straight on the, on the arm or something like that. That's just not common sense, com commonsensical. So you can, on the inside of the arm or in the lower arm even, uh, you can drop the oil on. You know, if you're doing a raindrop, for example, on somebody totally new, you can do that as well. But just keep in mind, there's, you know, nine oils. And so you want to put them on and you've got to kind of know which one's which. And then it might be, it might go red, but that redness might not be irritation necessarily. It might just be that it, the oil contains phenols and it's warming. Or if it can create some discomfort, then you know that there might be a sensitivity to it. Now, all sensitivities aren't allergies. You can have true allergies, which might end up fairly quickly in a rash or a irritation of some kind. But then we have, then we have what is a little bit hard to explain when you're trying to be non-compliant or actually trying to be compliant, trying not to be non-compliant. And that is that oils have an action. Once they connect with our bodies, they have a, um, let's say, a cleansing action. And if somebody is, um, let's, for want of a better word, toxic. So their lifestyle, they've smoked cigarettes, they've travelled, you know, in pollution every day, their diet is not that great, and they're they're you know they've somewhat built up in in they don't drink any water and and so on and you just know that you know that person has a build up of toxins in their body and then they they are exposed to the oils and the oils start to have have um, cleansing benefits and 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 these beautiful benefits for which we use the oils then that can cause a reaction. And we see that, I actually have seen it um, not commonly, but I have seen it with the savvy. So many people use toxic chem chemical makeup and skincare products, and then they put our pure stuff on their skin. And initially it creates this, what looks like a reaction. Now, if that person was to put a diluted version of that oil on or to work up to a, a, a dose or to detox first and then use our oils, then it could be a whole different kettle of fish. So if you have reacted to something, it may not be that you are allergic. It just may be the oil's been doing its job. So use your intuition. If you don't feel right, then don't use it again. But if that scenario that I explained to you sounds like it might be true for you, 
then test it again. Use it as a smaller amount and, and maybe put a little bit of, like in raindrop, we'll often, uh, if somebody's sensitive, we'll often rub their whole feet or their whole back in V6 oil first. So we're kind of pre-diluting and then put the oils on and you can do that too. You can do that with children. Just rub their feet or their legs with some V6 oil first and then put a little bit of um, oil on if that oil is okay to apply neat. So a word about toxins. So what I was gonna say here is that well, our environment, we already know this, particularly if you've been in Young Living for a while, then you know that our whole environment is, is to varying degrees toxic. If you live in beautiful, pristine New Zealand, then maybe that's not the case so much. But for the rest of us, particularly living in cities where you're exposed, one, to toxins in the water. So you drink water, you're drinking fluoride, you're drinking um, chloride and so on. And in, it, it may be dose dependent, but to some degree, those toxin, those, those chemicals are toxic. Then we breathe the air, we're driving in our cars, we're breathing fumes from cars, and then we're eating breakfast cereals that maybe were grown in pesticides. And so maybe there's pesticide residues, and so, or maybe our fruit has, has pesticides on it. And we're consuming maybe tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. But that compounded every day with then our deodorant that has chemicals in it and our makeup has chemicals and then our perfume that we put on and then we sit in the taxi or in our car and there's an air freshener and we go to the bathroom at the supermarket and there's air freshener, some, something spitting out, tech, you know, fragrant chemicals all day. and so. Our world, the point is, um, the point I'm getting to is our world is, is pretty toxic. And even if you're living in pristine environments, you may still be exposed to some. And then this level of toxicity produces um, or affects our well-being. It affects our general level of health. Now, in our culture, that general level of health that we call normal is pretty sick. So sick is the new normal. It's not pink is the new black, it's sick is the new normal. So maybe not you guys who have actually gone to learn, on to learn above the line health, where you're actually doing things to, to help minimize toxins, you've cleaned out the toxins in your home, your, your cleaning products are toxic free, uh, et cetera, et cetera, your skincare, your makeup, your, your air fresheners are not, they're essential oils now, then you're starting to become, you know, to have above, above average health. But for the, for the rest of the people out there, their normal is sick. And so when you're um, using oils with people, keep in mind that this is the environment that you're operating in. And you may need to go slow. You may need to go gentle. All right. Yes. Great. <laughs> A little bit of education in there. All right. So this beautiful image is illustrating the benefits of using uh, essential oils on the feet. So I have started using cedar wood. I poured it into a, um, a roll-on bottle that I bought at the New Zealand launch. I bought the roll-on bottles and I've been using cedar wood directly onto my feet last thing at night and um, oh, it's beautiful. But for children particularly, obviously that's the furthest away from their eyes and they don't typically, you know, oh, I guess if they're really small, they'll, they'll touch their feet, but it's the safest place to have it for them and for adults particularly, can be as well. So with direct inhalation, Direct inhalation isn't something you need to do all day for, for 10 hours. Um, the recommendation is, you know, if you're opening the bottle and inhaling, that you don't do that more than 10 to 15 times a day. So you might be, you might be thinking, oh, I've got a cold coming on or I've, I've you know, I'm feeling this way. Um, I'm going to, you know, inhale or I'm going to put my diffuser on all day or, and, and no, not always. 
the, the recommendation on the bottle is often diffuse for 15 or 30 minutes, three or four times a day, uh, something like that. So um, learn, you learn your, your appropriate application and direct inhalation has some cautions around it. Obviously with asthmatics, direct inhalation would be, you know, could potentially be dangerous. So we don't want to, um, we don't want to do that. The benefits of cedarwood actually are enormous. Um, I find it very restful at the end of the day and I find my sleep to be longer and, and, and more restful. So that's one of the many, many, it's um, many, many actions. I also use cedarwood actually in my, I put oil on my hair, on my scalp particularly, after every time I've washed my hair and it has benefits for creating luscious locks. Um, but there's an infographic that Young Living's developed for Cedarwood. If you look on the virtual office at the, in, in the infographics, um, you can read all about Cedarwood and even post that to, to Pinterest if you're into the social media technology side of things. Now, as we know, the essential oils and water don't mix all that well. And so there's some cautions around bath time. So if you put an oil into the water and it just sits on the top and then you put your baby in, they're going to get a dose, a, a mega dose potentially. So you always use bath oils one to three drops undiluted. And if you want more than that, then it's much better to mix that with some kind of Epsom salts, bath salts, or our, our bath gel that has no fragrance in it just to kind of emulsify it and it mixes in and it's not just all sitting on the top in that case. Even then, the recommendation is for no more than 10 drops. So, any questions about safety or science? I'm gonna just talk about, I mean, I've got so many favorite oils, honestly, I love cedar wood, there you go. Um, but I'm gonna give you just four of the absolute must-haves <laughs> and repeats, you know, on automatic repeat on your essential rewards. Um, any questions about safety or, uh, or science? I can take your questions, if you type them in, if I don't answer them, then in a future webinar, I might be able to answer them. But did you enjoy that? Did you learn something? Are you still awake? Yes, use your citrus oils with emulsifiers in baths. Yep, learning something. Magdalene said she is. Natalie, yes. Good. This is important information, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sue. And um, Amanda, Mary, yes, fantastic. All right, so we're almost done. I just want to give you just something lighter. Um, and for anyone that's been with Young Living longer than kind of a month, these might be your favourites as well. But um, just to give you my perspective on it. All right, so first of all, peppermint. Now, peppermint is part of our raindrop. So it's a cooling oil to the skin. So it's used in deep relief. It's obviously a culinary oil it's fantastic in chocolate mm. but m many other many other things that you can use um, even just in your water but be careful it's very potent and it sits on the top so you might want to kind of jiggle it up before you you take um, or put it in a large bottle but then it sits on the top so you do, you do need to be mindful with peppermint it's very cooling um, it's just one of those fantastic oils for diffusing. It's quite a strong diffusing oil. So it really elevates the ambience in a room quite quickly. Now, some of the oils you can hardly smell when you diffuse them, but peppermint's not one of them. It's fantastic for students when they're studying. It's great for exam preparation and studying and many, many other actions. So because the oils that I picked here really have multiple, multiple actions, so they're your kind of go-to oils that... Uh, cross over all of those bat, bat, um, into those areas. Frankincense. Frankincense being the king of oils has uh, you know, 
physical benefits and, and spiritual benefits and emotional benefits. I certainly use a lot of the oils that have frankincense in it for yoga when I'm doing essential oil yoga, just because it has a beautiful uh, balancing effect on the body. So yeah, Frankie lovers in the in the audience audience peppermints for a party, a peppermint party. Oh my gosh, sounds great. Peppermint chocolate party. <laughs> um, can you see the Q and A online? Uh, no, I don't publish the Q and A. Uh, orange for chocolate. Yes, absolutely. And Tan, we had we had ninja shots, ninja red shots at. Um, the, the New Zealand training. And one of my favourites out of that was actually tangerine. I really enjoyed the tangerine oil uh, flavouring the Ningxia Red. Um, it doesn't damage the throat, the peppermint. Just to go back to the peppermint, it doesn't damage the, the throat. But you don't want anything kind of overwhelming and, and closing, potentially causing some coughing. You just don't want that. Um, frankincense is a go-to oil. That's, that's one you want. Um, it's a very spiritual oil. And so it helps, uh, it's on a lot of the spiritual blends, so it's a it's sort of awakening the mind. So, you know, yeah, we want that, don't we? My third one would be citrus oil and the lemon in particular because you can use it for cleaning, you can use it for flavouring your oil, your water, beg your pardon, you can use it in lots of culinary action, you know, purposes. Um, it's beautifully cleansing and uplifting. It's in Ningxia Red, so it has that refreshing cleansing effect. Uh, it's just a beautiful oil to smell. It kind of feels clean and fresh. Uplifting. And it's uplifting. Another one we use in yoga in the, mm. in the kind of the, the middle part of the yoga when you want the energy, the peppermint or the lemon. Um, PSK oils are good for for encouraging people with, with the yoga as well. And then our final one is, of course, lavender. Frankie being the, the, the king, uh, I think lavender is the queen. I know we talk about Rose being a queen as well. She's a queen too. But lavender, from, from it's, oh, it's more affordable for us, um, us peasants. <laughs> so lavender is multi, multi-useful. In, in for children, it can be used culinary in culinary situations as well. Um, for for physically on the skin, for benefits in our skincare, for helping us sleep, and so on. So many, 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 many functions and uses for those four oils. All right, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, for your questions and listening to me, I'm going to just um, stop the recording.